to hear you this morning. Speak through me, God. Bless this place this morning. Amen. Okay. So before our reading for today, a quick recap on some of the things that Mike spoke about last week. Graham, if you can put the next slide up for me, that'd be fantastic. So a little bit of background. So Mike described the political situation um, at the time of Jeremiah as Israel's Brexit. Essentially, the country had split into two. There was a northern kingdom called Israel and a southern kingdom called Judah. Both countries were vulnerable to attack from much bigger and much more powerful neighbours. Now, at the time of writing, um, time of Jeremiah writing that is, Israel had been attacked and exiled by Assyria to the north. And that left Judah alone, weak and vulnerable, with danger all around. Now, Jeremiah was in the south. He was, bo- he was in Judah. He was born in a village close to Jerusalem, and he ministered as a prophet in the area around Jerusalem and inside Jerusalem. At the time he was ministering, which was, give or take, around 600 years or so before Jesus, Judah was feeling stressed and threatened. Everything in the country seemed to be heading towards disaster. We may be able to associate with that right now. Now, there may not have been queues at petrol stations, like there is here, um, for obvious reasons, no cars in those days, Um, but there may well have been food shortages, and there would certainly have been a feeling of despair, hopelessness, fear, and worry about what was going to happen next. So Judah is ministering, and he's speaking um, from God in this time. And he finds himself addressing a nation which is hurtling headlong towards judgment from God. Now, the Israelites may have feared the future as outside powers drew near, but rather than respond with humility and repentance, as you might expect people to do, that were threatened on all sides, the people of Judah primarily lived as islands unto themselves. They ignored God's commands. And the danger that resulted was increasing as they continued to be disobedient towards him. So that's, that's the situation that Jeremiah is writing in. That's the situation that, he, that God is speaking into. And now we come to our reading, which is uh, chapter 31, verses 1 to 9, and then 31, the, verses 31 to 34. And it's going to uh, be on the screen, as it is already. Um, and you will see that I've highlighted in red all of the words that God says. And I think one of the things that I really noticed as I was reading through and preparing for this is just in this passage just how much God has to say. You will see as we go through that it's virtually all read because this is all God speaking. These are all God's words. So I'm going to read this to us and let's just see what it is that God has to say as we go through. So chapter 31 verses 1 to 9 and then verses 31 to 34. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says. The people who survive the sword will find favour in the wilderness. I will come to give rest to Israel. The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. I will build you up again, and you, virgin Israel, will be rebuilt. Again, you will take up your timbrels and go out to dance with the joyful. Again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. There will be a day when watchmen cry out on the hills of Ephraim, Come, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. This is what the Lord says. Sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. Make your praises heard and say, Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them will be the blind and the lame, expectant mothers and women in labour. A great throng will return. They will come with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. 
I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble. Because I am Israel's father, and Ephraim is my firstborn son. And then verses 31 to 34. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbour or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. What I want to do this morning is go through and highlight some key verses from that reading that I think speak to us today in the situations that we might be facing. First one is verse 1, which says, as you can see on the screen, At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they will be my people. The Israelites had turned away from God. They had forsaken their Lord, their God. They had not followed his commands. They had not stuck to the covenant and the agreement that he had made with them. But despite that, despite them turning from God, despite their failure to follow his commands, despite the situation they were in, God never left them. He was still there. They were still and would always be his people. They had rejected him, but he had not rejected them. Today, we are God's people. He is our God now and will be our God forever. We can walk away from him if we want. We can forget him. We can try and do things our own way, and believe me, I've, I've done that. We've all done that. But he promises that he will never walk away from us. We are his people. He loves us. He will always be there for us. We will always be his people. Next verse, next slide, Graham, please. Verse 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. We sang about this this morning, didn't we, in our first song. God will love us forever. As, a, 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 as part of my, my training and part of my journey towards ordination, there are many books that you have to read. Andy will associate with this. Um, many books that you have to read. Some are good books, some are not so good books, some are easy to read, some are very difficult to read. Um, and there's a writer called... Um, Hon- I probably won't say this right. Henry Nguyen or words to that effect. Um, And he's written many books. He's a theologian and a writer and uh, written many, many books. And there was a book that I had to read of his called The Wounded Healer, that some of you may have heard of, um, which I found incredibly difficult to read. Um, And there's other books of his that I found much easier to read. But there's a quote that I found that I think really sums up this. And it says much more in this quote than I could ever say. It says this, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. This is a fundamental truth of your identity. This is who you are, whether you believe it or not. You belong to God from eternity to eternity. Life is just a little opportunity for you during a few years to say, I love you too. God promises to love us forever. I have loved you with an everlasting love. 
I don't know about you, but I cannot fathom quite how long forever is. Quite what eternity is, what that means. It's beyond my understanding. But God says he will love us forever, for eternity, everlasting. Incredible promise from a God that promises never to leave us and will always be with us. Next slide, please, Graham. So verse four. I will build you up again, and you, virgin Israel, will be rebuilt. Again, you will take up your timbrels and go out to dance with the joyful. Anybody watch Strictly last night? Yeah? Now, there were some people that were dancing with joy there, weren't there? I imagine that's a little bit what this will be like, without the judging and without Craig putting up the four paddle or whatever he does. God promises to restore us. He sees when we are struggling, when we're broken, when we're falling apart. He sees all of that, and because of his eternal love, his everlasting love for us, because we are his people, because he is God, he promises to rebuild us. When this happens, there will be music and dancing and joy. Some of us will dance better than others, but that's another story. What we need to do is trust in God's plan. Trust in God's plan for you, for your life. Now that might take longer than we might want. It's not necessarily going to be instant. We have to remember that it's God's timing and not ours, that God's in charge. But in the same way that God's promises to Israel were fulfilled, the people did come back from exile. In the same way that those promises were fulfilled, his promises to us will be true. We just have to trust him because he loves us and he promises to always be with us. Next slide, please, Graham. Verse 9. They will come with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble because I am Israel's father and Ephraim is my firstborn son. Now, part of Israel's restoration involved a recognition that they had let God down. They had not been the people that he wanted them to be. So in order to be restored, they had to acknowledge their failings. They had to acknowledge that they'd let God down and accept where they had gone wrong. Now, God will forgive because God loves. But for us to be forgiven and rebuilt, we first need to say we've got it wrong. And we all get it wrong. We get it wrong all the time. And if we can come to God with these things, if we can have that humility to say, yes, God, I've got it wrong. I need to come back to you. He promises to lead us back because he is our father and our creator. And his promises are true. But we first, we have to say, God, I'm sorry. I need you. Verse 34, next slide, please, Graham. Verse 34 says, No longer will they teach their neighbour or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Now, I've been in this church probably for about 12 years or so. We were, Sarah and I were working this out earlier. And in that time, I've heard many people speak, many people preach. And people have different styles of preaching, and they say different things, and they bring different things to it. Now, one person that always um, that stands out to me when they preach is Chris. I haven't spoken to Chris before, so Chris, this is not bad, I promise. Um, but... Um, one of the things with Chris is that one of the things I, I notice um, when Chris speaks is that pretty much every time that Chris speaks, it's about Jesus. It's coming back to Jesus. It's bringing us back to think about Jesus. And when I first started hearing Chris speak, I thought, oh, it's just going to be the same thing over and over again. And it's just we're t we're doing the same thing. And the more and more I've heard Chris speak, the more and more I've realized, and as I've learned and I've listened and I've done training and all that kind of stuff, the more and more I realize that actually, if we can't bring it back to Jesus, then what are we doing in the first place? We have to bring it back to Jesus. And Jeremiah brings it back to Jesus. Because Jeremiah, 
in speaking, verse 31 to 34, speaking of a new covenant with the people of Israel. The old covenants he made with Abraham and Moses and David had been broken and dismissed by the people. And that's what led to them being in exile in the first place. The people had walked, aside, walked away from their side of the deal, and as a result of this, tragedy had befallen them. They'd been exiled from the land that God had promised. Verses 31 to 34 speak of a new covenant, a new unbreakable covenant, a new plan, a rescue plan, not just for Israel, but a plan for the whole world over the whole of time. And that new covenant was Jesus. The hope of the world, the light of the world. Now, human beings, like the Israelites were, like most of us are, are deeply flawed and broken people. On our own, we can never be the people that God wants us to be. We're just not capable of doing that in our own strength. But Jesus, the new covenant, means we don't have to do it on our own. We are no longer individuals that have to do things on their own and bring their own, do things in their own strength. We do it because we have Jesus. Jesus will live in us if we allow him and change us from the inside out. God's love will be written on our hearts so that we can never escape it. We will know God in ways that before Jesus it was impossible to know him. We will have a relationship with God that before Jesus it was impossible for us to have. He will forgive us and love us with an everlasting love, an eternal love. See, for me, the hope of Jeremiah is that God sees, God loves, and God has a plan to restore and to rebuild. This was the hope of Israel and can be the hope of us today. Whatever it is that we're dealing with in our lives, however far we've walked away from God, however distant we might seem, however much we are struggling with what's going on in the world, the hope is that God sees, God loves, and God has a plan to rebuild and restore. I want to finish with this, which is a quote from a book that I've been reading called Gentle and Lowly by um, somebody called Dane Ortland. It's a fantastic book and I've learned so much from it. But I want to finish with this little quote. And it says this. God says, there is no end date on my commitment to you. You can't get rid of my grace to you. You can't outrun my mercy. You can't evade my goodness. My heart is set on you. My heart is set on you. Let's pray.